and in the last election. They can be dismissed as bigoted. And when political leaders promise a break on immigration, employers' organisations start fuming about the loss of reliable, often meaning foreign, workers. So is Ed Miliband's confession of past Labour mistakes the beginning of a serious new policy or merely a cynical attempt to defuse the issue? Tim Hewell reports from Crewe, where in 2006 he filmed for Newsnight on the social tensions immigration was causing. It's a place that sums up how recent migration has changed the face of Britain, a place most people speed through, but where, eight years ago, thousands of Poles suddenly and totally unexpectedly got off. By early 2006, as Newsnight discovered, the demography of a medium-sized town that had seen little previous immigration was transformed. Over the last 18 months, according to the local council, at least 3,000 Poles have arrived in this one town alone, immediately making up over 6% of the population. <music> Families like the Roberts weren't hostile to the incomers, but they were bewildered and long before the recession, remarkably prescient. It f feels as if you've walked into a foreign country sometimes, you think, oh, <laughs> just, where, where have I gone to? If this continues, the bubble will burst and jobs will, will start to become a lot scarcer. What happens then? What happens to where you've got English lads or British lads working alongside immigrant labour? Who gets the sack? The arrival of the migrants, following the eastern expansion of the European Union, came as a complete surprise to the then Labour government. It predicted net immigration from the new EU states would be between 5,000 and 13,000 a year. Some mistake. In fact, 576,000 arrived over the following seven years, peaking at 112,000 in 2007 alone. Today, the present Labour leader, Ed Miliband, kind of apologised. We too easily assumed that those who were worrying about immigration were stuck in the past, unrealistic about how things could be different, even prejudiced. But Britain was experiencing the largest peacetime migration in history, and people's concerns were genuine. For much of the last decade, there was a mismatch between what people were noticing and talking about in towns like Crewe and what politicians were prepared to talk about at Westminster. The full impact of European migration wasn't acknowledged, and many felt that showed the elitism of the political class. They weren't concerned about the problem because it didn't affect them. But schools and other services came under unexpected strain, and inevitably, but as very few politicians appeared to notice at the time, wages were sometimes driven down. Now that process is continuing as early migrants become more settled and new ones arrive from further afield. Brian Roberts has worked in the building industry for 45 years. For instance, uh, I've just spoke of a, an instance today with a, with a, with a colleague of mine who has had a gang of Romanian steel fixers on the site. I'm reliably informed that um, the gang master paid exactly half of what he was getting paid um, to, his, to his steel fixers. Now, and, and that, that wage which they were taking home was then well below basic minimum wage. It was recruitment agencies that fuelled migration to crew. For a while, this one had a branch in Poland and was single-handedly responsible for attracting many of the new workers. Our name was being published in, in the equivalent of almost the Daily Times in Poland, to, not to our knowledge. And suddenly, um, we were getting two to three to four hundred emails a week. The firm, which has since changed hands, has always paid the minimum wage or above, as do most others. Labour now wants new regulation to ensure that recruitment agencies don't exclude British workers. But they say they never did, 
they just don't get enough local applications. The reason Labour didn't talk much about European migration isn't just because of blindness or political correctness, it's because there are no easy solutions. Most EU citizens have a right to work here and as recruitment agencies like this will tell you, they're often politer and more punctual than local job seekers and more willing to do jobs that locals often won't take on. Filling a local skills gap, for example in the electrical trade, is one way to create a more level playing field in employment. More apprentices like this are now being trained, but they still face competition from incomers. I'm pretty sure with people coming over from different countries, they're willing to work for a lot less. And you actually, do you encounter that? You see it from time to time on site, yeah. Crew, like many similar places up and down Britain, is now more mixed ethnically than ever before. Most locals accept that, but they certainly wish they'd had more warning. Tim Hugh, so is this really a complete change of heart from Labour? I've been speaking to Labour's Shadow Community Secretary, Hilary, Hilary Benn. To be absolutely clear, this is the Labour Party saying there are too many immigrants in this country. Uh, no, it isn't that. What, we, what Ed Miliband did say today that was that in relation to the A8 accession states, we got it wrong in not putting in place uh, transitional controls, which, looking back on it, we should have done, and had we done so, then, of course, uh, fewer people would have come from those countries. But So there's not too many immigrants in this country. You got it wrong about the numbers coming in, but somehow there's not too many. In other words, this is all about innuendo, isn't it? I, I couldn't disagree with you more, Gavin. This is about recognising uh, the benefits and some of the consequences, understanding that there are people who, when they see communities changing very fast, they can feel uncomfortable about that. It doesn't mean they're bigots if they express that view. It's also about looking at the way in which the economy works. There is some evidence that... Um, Eastern European immigration has had an impact on wage rates. Um, there are some recruitment agencies that say that we only recruit people who come from certain Eastern European countries. That can't be right. It's also about looking at the skills that people who've been mm. born and brought up in this country, wherever they came from originally, have, so that they too can participate in the labour market. But you are accepting, are you not, then, that there is a cultural issue, that somebody can say, a parent can say in Leeds, look, my local school, more than half the children don't speak English as a uh, first language, and I'm worried about that. And to say that isn't bigoted, is it? Well, I, I don't find constituents actually tending to say that. They talk about housing, they talk about jobs. Uh, in some parts of the country, they talk about the pace at which their community has changed. And that's why it's right that we should be debating it and looking at some practical solutions. For example, whether people are, are from the UK originally or they've come from abroad, making sure that everyone gets the national minimum yep. wage. So doubling the fine would be one step. Looking at the work of the Gangmasters Licensing Authority, which we set up in the wake of that terrible tragedy in Morecambe, so that... Uh, should it look at other sectors of the economy? I mean, if, if your proposals go through, one in four Im, uh, immigrants, if a workforce contains more than one in four immigrants, the job centres should get involved, that would apply to a lot of hospital wards, wouldn't it? And, and, and what would you do about that? Well, you, you've got to look at the particular sectors. Look, let's be clear, the country has gained a lot from immigration. I'm talking to you from Leeds, where many people have come from all over the world. But can you say, uh, is there any upper limit to the number of immigrants who should be allowed into this country because of the kind of social strains and consequences you've talked about? Well, we've said as part of our, our policy review, we'll look at the question of caps, but you've got to be straight with people about Eastern European migration because uh, there is no control of that apart from during the transition period. And that's why we said very clearly today, looking back on it, we should have put those controls in place. The problem with the government's cap mm is it only applies to a very small proportion of migration. We did, when we were in government, put in place the points-based system, which allows us to bring people in where there is a need, where there is a, a, a skill shortage, and that is very sensible. What, what, and the government, of course, has carried on with that. What about non-EU immigration, which some people feel uh, is culturally more difficult to assimilate? And that's not a, a matter that you've discussed. Uh, well, uh, with respect, the points-based system does apply 
to non-EU migration. And that is something that we did do, we're in government, because we thought it was right that we should be looking at what the, the skill needs are. And if there is a shortage and it's important for the economy, then you can allow people in. But you, you should be able to control immigration. I believe in immigration control, and that is a sensible policy. And as I was saying, the government has continued with that because it was the right thing to do. Hilary Benn, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Deborah Mathinson was Gordon Brown's chief pollster and now runs the opinion research company Britain Thinks. And the Daily Mail journalist Ian Birrell was a speechwriter for David Cameron in the 2010 campaign, but thinks they are getting it wrong now on immigration. Um, just first of all, do, do you see this uh, announcement by Ed Miliband as him saying, actually, uh, we've got a problem, a political problem about this, and it's a vote loser for Labour. We've got to deal with it. I, I think he is, yes. Uh, I mean, basically, the situation that Labour finds itself in is that we're seeing a lot of disillusionment with the government, but people not yet rushing towards Labour. Um, because I think they're not yet ready. Labour doesn't have the licence to be heard yet. And I don't think it'll have that until it really accepts responsibility for some of the things that people think it got wrong last time. And immigration is clearly one of them. Did, when you do focus groups, or when you did them uh, mm -hmm. through the last government, does it come up a lot? Yes. I mean, and we saw a real change as well. I mean, in, in, in 1999, fewer than 5% said that immigration was one of the top problems facing the country. Uh, it's now number two only to the economy. You know, people are really, really worried about it. Ian, do you, do you think that there is actually among the main parties, a bit of a political consensus about this, that this is the, you know, the headline is immigration spiralling out of control, something must be done and so on and so on. And actually there's quite a bit of agreement fundamentally there is a problem. I think all the parties have accepted that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. But the trouble is they're all, I thought the speech today was just disingenuous drivel. And all the parties and all the parties are coming out with this empty rhetoric and promises. But actually it's all down to economics and there's very little they can do. We live in a globalised world. And what they're not saying and should be saying, what Ed Miliband should have been saying today was apologising for the fact that they're not telling the truth about immigration. They should be saying immigration has been very good for this country. It benefits our public services because immigrants are less likely, uh, are more likely to pay taxes and less likely to take, use benefits and use public services. It helps our pension crisis and it's good for the British economy. But that's not what they're but saying. He did that's say... why the public, that's right. why we have the public in such a mess on this because politicians haven't been straight. Politicians haven't stood up and just said, actually, immigration is extremely beneficial beneficial for us, we need it, and there's actually not all that much we can do about it. But I think, I think mm. people think yeah. that politicians haven't been straight because they haven't allowed there to be a debate, and I think that's one of the points that Ed made very clearly today. Uh, it's not that they're not, uh, you know, that, that, that they're not making the right noises, they're not talking about it at all, is what people think, that the, the discussion is closed down, that if you raise it, you're, you're regarded as a bigot. Um, I, you know, I, I think that's what's this, wrong it, with the is, debate. Is it not... that or is it that there's actually no easy solution, as you suggest, which no. is there may not be a solution? I think we endlessly hear there's no debate, and we've heard there's no debate all the time while people are debating it. We had um, <laughs> Phil Woolis get into trouble over it. Uh, because he was debating it and was coming up with pretty xenophobic nonsense. We had Margaret Hodge talk about the pressure on social housing, which allowed the BNP to sweep to power in her local area. We've had Gordon Brown raise it. We've had David Blunkett but, raise I mean, it. There's you, endless the, debate the, about the it. Reality the reality is, is they're not honest. The they're reality not honest is, they say, A, there's yeah. nothing we can do about it because it's about economics, and B, it's actually good for okay, the country but, and it helps our public services. Yeah, but that is a message that a lot of people are not apparently willing to listen to. Well, and that's people, right. people, see, people see this as a problem uh, down exactly, their street. You have you know? to start with where people are. Um, um, you know, I think there are obviously a lot of a lot of good points to make about immigration economically. But if you don't start with where people are, they're not going to hear that. They're not going to listen. They're not going to be persuaded. So, I, I mean, I think what Ed has done today, um, quite successfully, actually, is to, is to say, I understand how you feel. I understand the problems. He's also talked about the benefits. He talked about the benefits of Im immigration in the speech. Yeah. But the trouble is, what he's saying is he's promising... a very kind of level argument. He's saying, I hear your pain, and he's promising absolutely nothing. It's all absolute rubbish. He's saying, right, we'll have this early warning system when we get a, com a recruitment company which gets up to 25%. But when I saw Hillary Benn being asked, what are you going to do about it then, he had no answer. Yet again, it's offering fig leaf solutions. And that's going to make the public well, I, more concerned. What uh, they should be the doing country, is standing actually, up saying out loud and proud that... that uh, but immigration is very good for the country, that we need it, that it helps our public services. Ed Miliband well, started the, the day. One of the things that he, he said, said was, the let's day. be honest, no, let's not over the day okay. saying but, it was bad for the but, public but services but and there needed to be an if, inquiry. If some leading politician said that, 
made that argument? I mean, what would, what would happen? Well, I, I think people would just close down. They wouldn't listen to it because what they're saying is this at the moment that, you know, people feel that it causes more problems than it offers solutions. And unless you start where they are at the problem end of things, you're not going to be able to persuade people of the solutions. But we never hear anything except for the prep. All we ever hear from politicians are the problems and we never hear the solutions. I think that's, that's just not true. The politicians have failed to give any leadership on this issue whatsoever and that's why the public has a lot of myths and misconceptions because of the appalling political Ian, leadership Ian, in do, all parties. Ian, but do you accept that there is, a, as I tried to explore with Hillary Blen, Ben, a cultural issue there that people see their communities changing, it causes a degree of fear and concern and that's perfectly legitimate. Course, it's not bigoted to raise absolutely that. Absolutely not. No, of course there are concerns and there are issues and that's why it's so wrong for politicians to keep coming out with this sort of shallow rhetoric and empty drivel that we hear today. What you need to be doing is actually saying, yes, but actually there's a plus side to it and it's good for our schools. The study came out that if there's Polish kids in schools, schools do better, that it's good for housing, not bad for housing, and stop propagating the myths that again we heard today from Ed Miliband. 25% of the population think that if you weren't born in this country, you shouldn't be educated by the state here. I mean, that's where people's views are at the moment. Well, that's I'm not because saying of that's the way right. politicians have I'm been handling that's, this. That's this is because think. of the lack of leadership, but and that's I, why we have those sorts see, of views. I think what and this Ed just said, feeds into it and makes it all far worse. I think it's what Ed said word. very carefully today was let's not overpromise. You know, let's. Uh, he he was, he was critical of what David Cameron has said because it's not deliverable. Okay. We'll leave it there. Thanks very much.